Only 6% of businesses have full visibility of their supply chain, which means a lot of harmful practices still go unnoticed. That's not good enough. At Standard Chartered, we're working with businesses to adopt responsible supply chain standards. By doing so, we help ensure that the things you buy are made the right way. Because we're not here for good enough. We're Standard Chartered, and we're here for good. Only 6% of businesses have full visibility of their supply chain. Which means a lot of harmful practices still go unnoticed. That's not good enough. At Standard Chartered, we're working with businesses to adopt responsible supply chain standards. By doing so, we help ensure that the things you buy are made the right way. Because we're not here for good enough. We're Standard Chartered, and we're here for good. We've been here since the beginning. As the first bank in Malaysia, our story began on Beach Street, Penang in 1875. Since then, we've been on this journey with you, pioneering new paths along the way. Through the years and the many generations, we've reached out for the greater good of Malaysia. Today, across the country, from cities to townships, we endeavor to serve you, to understand you, to do good by you, to be here for you. At Standard Chartered, we continuously have you on our minds in the things we do and the decisions we make. We create financial solutions that protect you and inspire you to achieve your aspirations. We open gateways for your business to flourish, linking your products and services to markets around ASEAN and the world, connecting you through our global capabilities and local knowledge. We pioneer digital innovations and technology that benefits you and the communities around you. We invest in the potential of our youth, giving them tools and platforms to realize their ambitions. We empower women entrepreneurs because we believe in equal opportunities for all. We champion our environment, protecting resources for our future generations. We excite you with global sponsorships and world-class events promoting health and goodwill. As Malaysia's first bank, we live by our purpose of driving commerce and prosperity through our unique diversity. For over a century, we played an integral role in driving Malaysia's economy and facilitating trade and investment. We remain relevant through several generations of Malaysians by growing, protecting, and managing their wealth. What truly differentiates us is our international presence. As the only global bank present in all 10 ASEAN markets, we see many opportunities. Our extensive network and deep insights can enable Malaysian companies to remain competitive and foster investment and growth within ASEAN and beyond. Standard Chartered is a truly global bank but we're also deeply local. We know we've got a fabulous global network. Malaysia is at the heart of that. And our business in Malaysia has always been a fantastic mix of the two. We're connecting Malaysia to the rest of the world and connecting the rest of the world to Malaysia. I'm proud of how much we have accomplished for the country, true to our promise of being here for good. 
and as our nation prospers, we continue to look forward to be here for you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Esther Ng, Chief Content Officer of Star Media Group, and I'm honored to be your host for the session tonight. Thank you for tuning in to the very first webinar for the Export Excellence Award 2021. This webinar, Shaping the Future, Broadening Economic Networks and Opportunity, will be a one and a half hour session. It is streamed live on Starbiz Facebook page so thank you for tuning in right now. Please do share our face, our Starbiz FB Live with your colleagues or friends, okay? All right, a few quick housekeeping matters before we start. As everyone dials in to this webinar through different internet bandwidth and devices, you may or may not experience minor technical glitches. So please be patient if there's any. To minimize the risk of technical glitch, participants are muted and the, and the video can turn off by default. Do participate by posting questions to our speakers at any time during the session. On your user panel, click on the Q&A button and post your questions if you are using Zoom or use the comments section if you are watching via F FB Live. You can also interact with each other using the chat feature in Zoom or the comments section in Facebook. There will be a short survey at the end, so those joining us on Zoom, please take a few minutes to complete it. Your opinion matters. Lastly, and equally important, please engage, learn and enjoy. Before we start, allow me to do a quick introduction of Export Excellence Awards. These awards, fondly known as EEA, is into its second year. We are glad to have Standard Chartered Bank of Malaysia return as our partner, together with Martrade, as patron in championing the achievements of Malaysia's finest exporters. Through this award, we hope to motivate and inspire businesses to further elevate the awareness of Malaysian brands internationally. The award is more than to celebrate the best of the best in the export world. The year-long pro program, from its launch to roadshows and judging sessions, were designed to form a community for export players. Through this, we aim at building a fraternity that supports one another, share thought leadership, best practices and corporate role models. To begin tonight's session, I'd like to invite Datofu Akiao, Chairman of Star Media Group, to give the welcome address. Over to you, Datuk Fu. A very good evening, distinguished speakers. Yang Mohd Datuk Sri Mohd Azmin Ali, Senior Minister, Minister of International Trade and Industry. Mr. Abra Anwar, Managing Director and CEO, Standard Charter Bank Malaysia. Puan Sharimatun Mat Saleh, Deputy CEO, Madrid. Miss Wendy Ang, country head of transaction banking and head of cash product, Standard Charter Bank, Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you all for participating in this webinar on Export Excellence Awards. Our special appreciation goes to Minister uh, YB Dr. Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali for your keynote address. At Star Media Group, we have had the privilege to closely follow the latest development and growth of the export industry and have noted the critical role of, of export to the nation's sustained economic growth, especially in this extremely challenging time. For this webinar session, we are happy to highlight a significant development which will bring about change to the overall business environment. This development is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, 
that is set to reignite economic growth in the Asia-Pacific region. Before and after RCEP was signed on November 15, Star Media Group had put up news coverage and facts associated with the regional trade agreement in both the Star newspaper and online portal. As you all know, the formation of uh, RCEP is not only a major new development in the region that could possibly impact our econ businesses and the economy. We also understand the significance of this pact to other 14 countries in the region. Hence, we will not only just carry news and views of leaders, but also highlights, explanations, features, analysis and graphic of RCEP and how it would help our readers understand it better. Our ASEAN Plus desk in particular has given extensive coverage on this subject and will continue with this endeavour. More than just disseminating and dissecting the information of RCEP, we will also be organising a series of web manners to drive greater awareness. As you all know, Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, will benefit significantly from RCEP as this would open up more market access to not just existing ASEAN market, but also non-ASEAN members of RCEP, especially China and Japan. In addition, ASEP favourable rules of origin will also attract foreign investment into Malaysia and other member countries. However, we must adopt technology and strengthen our human resources to improve our efficiency, productivity and competitiveness in order to benefit from the opportunities under RCEP. As RCEP connects, about 30% of the world's people and economies. It is expected to bring tremendous benefit to the world. According to a working paper released by Peterson Institute of International Economics, RCEP could add 209 billion US dollar annually to the world income and uh, about 500 billion USD to the world trade by year 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the World Bank, this trade agreement encompasses 27% of the global mechanized trade, over 18% of the services trade, and 19% of uh, foreign direct investment outflows. Understanding the importance of uh, RCEP, Star Media Group will continue to provide up-to-date news and information about RCEP for our readers and the business community. On the Export Excellence Award, the award is set to be the definitive accolade for exporters in Malaysia. As such, I will strongly encourage all our exporters in Malaysia to challenge yourself and put your companies out there. Use your submission to analyse and review the strength and the, success, the weakness of your company and how far you have grown your business. With hard work, I'm confident it will become a great success for your company. Lastly, Star would like to thank Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia for being our partner in this award. With that, I wish everyone all the best and have a fruitful session tonight with our panel of esteemed speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fu. As mentioned by our chairman, the Export Excellence Awards is a good platform for businesses to analyse and review how far you've grown your business. 
So do take this opportunity to participate in the awards to review and showcase your journey. Log on to exportawards.com.my for more details. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Abra Anwar, Managing Director and CEO of Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia, to deliver the opening address. The floor is yours, Mr. Abra. Assalamualaikum and a very good evening to Yang Barhamad, Datu Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali, Senior Minister, Minister of International Trade and Industry, Malaysia. Dato Fu Akio, Chairman, Star Media Group. Puan Sharimathan Matsale, Deputy CEO, Malaysia External Trade Development Corporation, Mart Trade. Our esteemed clients, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and thank you for taking time out from your busy schedule to join us today. I hope everyone is keeping safe and well. Special thanks to your honorable for delivering the keynote address. We are honored and delighted to have you here with us today. Together with the Star Media Group and Martrade, we launched the Export Excellence Awards last year. With a positive response, we are pleased to embark on the 2020-2021 series to continue to recognize exporters for their contributions to the nation's economy, as well as their increasing export presence in the global arena as they achieve sustainable growth via new and innovative strategies to thrive in the face of adversity. As part of the program, we have lined up a series of webinars that features industry experts to provide insights that will help you seek out opportunities amid global uncertainties. The effect of the COVID-19 pandemic has evolved into an economic and social crisis. Many businesses are severely affected. However, with the gradual reopening of the economy, we are beginning to see a glimmer of positivity as businesses resume. The recent signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, agreement with 15 countries brings a ray of light and hope amid the clouds as the RCEP marks ASEAN's biggest free trade pact to date, covering a market of 2.2 billion people with a combined size of 24.8 trillion US dollars or 28.9% of the world's GDP. The RCEP will be able to give our economy a much needed boost for a swift and robust recovery during these challenging times. In particular, Small and medium enterprises tend to benefit with a more level field between developed and less developed economies. Strengthening regional supply chains and facilitating ventures into new opportunities. Our deep knowledge of local markets and our understanding on the important role of mid corporates in growing our Malaysian economy and their banking needs puts us in a strong position to help companies internationalize and grow through our network capabilities, market knowledge and expertise, elements that are crucial for expanding businesses overseas. Despite the current bleak sentiment, the pandemic has been a major catalyst for digitalization. Over the last nine months, we have seen massive changes in the way organizations operate. Amid the disruptions, one clear trend has emerged. Digital transformation has accelerated across every industry, with digital channels having become the primary conduits of customer engagement, business productivity, and supply chain resiliency. Technology has always been at the heart of our strategy in driving efficiencies, increasing automation, introducing global platforms reducing manual errors, and strengthening how we combat financial crime. Globally, we at Standard Chartered have invested close to 1 billion US dollars between 2015 and 2018 in digital wealth management and infrastructure 
including areas such as artificial intelligence, chatbots and cyber security. Having spotted the way world was going even before a crisis forced us to adapt, we are now best placed to help businesses endure this crisis while providing simpler and more convenient banking. Today, we have the leading digital capabilities to enable best-in-class customer experience, operations, and risk management. As Malaysia's first bank with a 145 years of history of facilitating trade and investment in the country, we remain as committed as ever to provide a platform for exporters to showcase their capabilities and global potential through the Export Excellence Awards. Through the awards, we hope to inspire and encourage businesses to grow beyond Malaysia while honoring the heroes of the nation who are showing tremendous resilience while navigating the global headwinds and demonstrating excellence in thriving in adverse conditions. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let me close with a note of thanks and deepest appreciation to the Star Media Group for giving us this very exciting opportunity again to partner with them on the Export Excellence Awards. We also express our heartfelt gratitude for the patronage and support provided by the Ministry of International Trade and Industry and Mart Trade. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abra and the Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia for your efforts in providing a platform for exporters to showcase their capabilities and global potential through the Export Excellence Awards. Moving on, I'd like to invite Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali, Senior Minister, Minister of International Trade and Industry, to deliver the keynote address on our set. The stage is yours, YB Azmin. Datuk Fu Akiao, Chairman Star Media Group, Inca Abra Anwar, MD and CEO Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia, Puan Sharimatun Mat Saleh, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Madrid, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and a very good evening. First and foremost, thank you for inviting me to address this inaugural webinar for Export Excellence Awards EEA. I'm delighted to note that this is the second consecutive year this award is taking place and I applaud the joint initiative between Star Media Group, Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia and Madrid in recognizing Malaysia's exporters' contribution to the economy. Exports of goods and services are critical to a country's economy as it spurs job creation, fosters economic growth and elevates market presence in the global arena. We know that exporting does not benefit only large companies, but importantly, also the small and medium enterprises. They can ride on the value chain and reach out to new markets for expansion whilst benefiting from knowledge and technology transfer in the process. Through this EEA webinar, I hope all of you joining us tonight will take advantage of the free educational series to chart and develop new strategies to access new markets and to remain competitive. I'm sure the sharing sessions by the speakers will spark new ideas and inspire businesses to venture beyond their comfort zones in order to seek more global opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, the international market is highly sophisticated and competitive. In order to excel in this market, exporters need to meet the international standards among other requisites. As the National Trade Promotion Agency, Madrid's core services include, include assisting Malaysian companies in the areas of exporters' development, export promotion, trade and market insights and trade advisory. Madrid is tasked to assist Malaysian companies to sell to the world and connect foreign buyers to buy from Malaysia. 
with Madrid's massive network of 46 offices in major commercial cities around the world, as well as at home, and reinforced with a multi-sectoral and global bias database, Malaysian companies, especially SMEs, have the opportunity to reach out to world markets. In the recent update of Malaysia's trade performance, Malaysia's trade surplus in October 2020 has widened to 22.12 billion ringgit, registering a double digit growth of 25.9% year on year and was the highest trade surplus ever recorded for the month of October. Exports in the meantime reached 91.05 billion ringgit in October 2020, increasing by 0.2% as compared to October 2019. This was the third highest export value recorded thus far. The expansion was supported mainly by higher exports to the United States, China, India and the United Kingdom. Imports total 68.93 billion ringgit, decreasing by 6%, while total trade was valued at 159.98 billion ringgit, a contraction of 2.5%. As announced by Bank Negara recently, the country's GDP in the third quarter of 2020 recorded a much smaller contraction at negative 2.7%, compared to the second quarter of 2020, which was at negative 17.1%. This shows there is significant recovery in economic activities, mainly due to reopening of the economy after the implementation of the movement control orders and improved external demand factors. Further, it must be said that the economic stimulus measures that were introduced underscored two salient points. One, that the government being mindful of the severe economic impact of the pandemic took swift, decisive and bold action by implementing the economic stimulus packages. Two, the economic recovery measures were strategically targeted at the key sectors that would provide the necessary impetus to mitigate the repercussions and in turn boost recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP is expected to boost Malaysia's economic revival to cushion the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. RCEP provides Malaysia's businesses access to a market of limitless possibilities whilst also serving to attract quality FDI. Altogether, the RCEP member countries have an estimated GDP of 25.8 trillion US dollars, accounting for about 29% of the world's GDP and comprising 30% of the world's population. This makes RCEP the largest trading bloc in the world in real GDP terms. The primary purpose of RCEP is to modernize and act as an overarching mechanism in synchronizing free trade agreements or FTAs between the 15 countries. Specifically, RCEP brings together a harmonized set of rules and procedures pertaining to access of preferential tariffs across the region. It will also open doors for businesses to capitalize on opportunities that would lead to a broader spectrum of new markets. Although tariff liberalization has already progressed significantly among the 15 RCEP members over the past decade through a wide network of FTAs, RCEP is set to further reduce trade barriers. To enhance our competitiveness, Malaysia is committed to playing a more open game by leveraging on a higher gear in the big league, which will spur greater FDI from nations that are looking to generate synergies from this new pack. Malaysian companies, especially SMEs, can also benefit from the advanced technical cooperation in digitalization 
and smart manufacturing, which will enable them in developing more innovative and competitive products. This would consequently strengthen supply chains, which, as we know, have been savaged by COVID-19. Nevertheless, the pandemic has also forced entire industries to rethink and transform their global supply chain models for business continuity. Hence, migrating into digital supply chain networks from the traditional linear supply chain models has made all the difference in getting businesses to be better connected to their ecosystem. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the APEC Putrajaya Vision 2040 coupled with the RCEP agreement would be able to deepen regional economic integration, bringing forth a vast array of multiplier effects. Both will be game changers, tools to invigorate growth, and will holistically serve to facilitate trade as well as attract even greater investments that is said to benefit the region as a whole. The future of Malaysia's economic development lies in our hands. Let us all work together for the revival of our economy and to emerge stronger from this crisis. In closing, I would like to congratulate everyone who is involved in organizing this series of EEA webinars. I wish all of you a fruitful and productive deliberation and success in your undertakings. Terima kasih and stay safe. Thank you, YB, Datu Sri Muhammad Azbin Ali, for the very insightful speech. I'm sure many companies will take heed from your keynote address. To continue with our programme for the night, I will now invite Wendy Ang, Head of Transaction Banking and Head of Cash Products, Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia. In her role, Wendy is responsible for the transactional banking PNL, executing, executing strategies in line with global agendas and commercializing innovative solutions for growth in a transaction banking for Malaysia. Welcome, Wendy. Hi, thank you and good evening. And thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is Wendy and I head the transaction banking business for Standard Chartered Malaysia. Transaction banking here encompasses both your cash management and your trade finance requirements for corporates. So I'm going to give uh, about 15 minutes or so sort of presentation to speak about specific, specifically on trade finance, the risks associated with it, and also some digitalization agenda. So I've been, I've been in the transaction banking business for almost um, 18 years now. So I've covered all segments. I've done uh, small and medium enterprises. I've done middle markets. I've done large local corporates. And of course, I've also covered uh, multinationals, FDIs that come into the country to actually build a local presence and expand uh, their, their presence in this part of the world. So I guess uh, one thing that I must say is that uh, throughout my years of experience, um, trade finance while being very, very uh, dynamic to some extent, is also very similar across all the segments in one way or the other. So let me let me spend a few minutes um, just to explain a little bit about what is trade and what is trade finance, right? So trade as the word signifies itself is actually international buying or selling or domestic buying or selling across goods and services. Then um, there's this word trade finance, so many people would normally associate trade finance with actually getting a loan. For example, if you had to um, buy some raw materials from overseas and you didn't have enough funding, then you will typically go to a bank, um, reach out to a relationship manager, ask them to evaluate your credit and give you a facility. And that facility will cover your working capital requirements. So that is what trade finance is. But more than that, but really more than that, um, what trade finance really also covers is, um, I would say the most fundamental, most important element of trade would be the risk management, the risk mitigants around it. Hence, this is why I'm showing my slide today to all of you to, to point out some of the key risks that there is in trade finance. So in, in, in my many years in trade finance, 
I've seen um, many mega downfalls, many uh, in, in very adverse economic uh, situations. So watching this space so much, I've seen companies actually literally uh, belly up overnight. Because, uh, so why has this happened, right? It's really happened because of the lackluster uh, risk management uh, around the trade transactions. So the thing is, you, you as a company, you need your business and you want to grow, you want to expand, you need to expand to some extent, but at the same time, you always need to balance between um, growing and also thinking about your, the new ventures and whether it's trustworthy enough for yourselves. So my advice to this is really two prong. Um, the rule number one, I would say, is really to work with an organization, a firm, a bank that actually um, understands and knows how to facilitate the trade transaction for you rather than doing it on your own. And, and rule number two, I guess, would be more important is that um, we need to look, at, look for an organization, a bank that actually has the reach, the network, um, and also the understanding of markets especially when we go into the emerging markets, the developing markets. When you talk about these places, the, the, the added complexity around it will be very high. And therefore, it's good to actually work with someone that knows how to um, you know, go around this. So I just want to uh, take this opportunity to speak a little bit about Standard Charter, a few facts about it. We've been in, the, in most markets for about uh, over a century. For Malaysia uh, itself, we've been around for um, 145 years. Um, we are the oldest bank uh, in the country, and in fact, we started as a uh, we, are, we started as a trade bank to start with, right? And we are a universal bank, meaning that we actually cover all segments. And I guess the the biggest forte that the bank has really is on the network. Um, when it comes to going into regions in, for example, Asia, Middle East, Africa continents, these are the, the areas where we are normally the first port of call when it comes towards any advice or consultation about how to trade with these markets. So um, let me just go back to a little bit on the risk, right? Uh, no doubt it's, it's not easy. It's a, it's a very tough uh, uh, process to actually uh, track and um, we wouldn't want it to hinder your business, right? So, so a few tips that I want to give to all the new exporters or semi-new exporters that is uh, joining this call today, when you go into new markets, I guess the first thing that you really need to look at is the how to evaluate your methods of payment. Okay, you would have heard about uh, documentary credit or letters of credit. So this is still, um, I mean, this is still one of the most secure way for you to actually uh, transact with your buyers. But it is very important that uh, when, when we talk about LCs, letter of credits, you, you can't just um, wash your hands and say, okay, um, I'm dealing with letters of credits, therefore we can go straight into the transaction. I think there are a few things that you need to really watch out for and dig a bit deeper. Um, would be, that would be kind of like, you need, you need the first thing you need to find out is whether, um, where the LC actually comes from, who is the issuing bank, um, that would be the first. The second would be really around what would be the format of the LC which can secure you. So not, I, I won't be going too much into detail into this today, but just to um, caution that um, these are the areas that you should watch out for. You should get more details. And if you, and if you go into this, you should then reach out to your bank and actually get the further advice. So at least this can help you mitigate some of the risks that you see in the slides uh, that I've, I've shown today, right? So further to this, we have also gone uh, a bit further um, on top of risk management, uh, we also cover um, balance sheet management. So we call this the ecosystem or the supply chain financing. So for example, just an example is like, um, if you wanted us to purchase your receivables, meaning that you wanted the money upfront, get the cash, and then the bank actually helps you to then um, facilitate the collection thereafter. So this is something that um, we also do on top of risk management. And, and it also helps you in any case that your client that you deal with, um, your new clients refuse to go on an LC basis, you might also want to cover this using um, uh, account receivables purchase. So this is um, pretty much the, the first part of the um, section that I want to speak about today. And um, ladies and gentlemen, maybe before I go into my next segment, um, 
Let me just share with you a little bit about a survey that we did uh, recently. So we did a survey um, with a large group of uh, uh, medium, small corporates. And this was really around their priorities during the pandemic. So we, we all know that the pandemic was a health issue. It actually turned out to be quite a severe economic issue, right? So, so we did a survey around it about the, um, we did the survey about how their priorities would be. And the, these were the results. So firstly, about 71% actually said that um, they should start to be more risk conscious now going forward. Uh, for their business, which ties into my earlier discussion, the first segment, right? The second, the second uh, point result that came out was that uh, 61% said that we should be more agile, more flexible with our operations, working from home, which all makes sense, I would think. And thirdly, which then uh, brings me to my, my, my next topic today, is that the results showed that about 60% actually said that we should be a lot more resilient and a lot more digital. Right. So I, I want to spend a bit of time today uh, speaking about digitalization, which is then related uh, re relating to your trade as well. Right. So I'm showing this slide. Uh, I, th I think what I want to start off with is the fact that today um, you hear a lot of buzzwords in the market. You hear blockchain, AI, artificial intelligence, big data, API. And, and really, the, 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 there really needs to be a clear separation between the hype of these words and really the practicality and the applicability of this to your corp to the corporates, right? So we did an analysis. We did analysis on our client journey, digital journey, uh, which is then illustrated in this slide here today. So our observations were actually um, where we had shortlisted into about four key client stakeholders that we feel are very important in this digital journey. So they are the procurement head, they're the CFO, the treasurer, and the innovation hit. And we also covered the potential areas where um, the, this might interest them on the digital journey. So let me pick up a few, uh, a few problem statements in trade, right? And, and give you the solutions around it. So trade, um, the first problem statement is that trade has been um, traditionally very, very paper-based, very cumbersome, um, troublesome, and it's an industry been for a very long time in the industry. So the solution that has come around for digitalization around this is really to create a digital platform, which now already exists to support electronic documentation. So no more are the days that you have to actually courier very large, heavy documents across the world to between a buyer and a seller. So that actually supports a lot of these key um, stakeholders. Another, another very, um, Often a uh, problem statement is also around the supply chain management, which is actually still very manual in a lot of, a lot of corporates today. So there is a solution that we already have around this and which is using blockchain, right? A lot of people will have heard of it and it's really about leveraging a distributor ledger technology so that you can convert your physical, your information, your financial supply chain together and optimizing the use of digital trade data rather than physical. So this can help you to point one, increase transparency. Number two, increase speed. Number three, also automation via everyone using a common digital platform, right? So um, an another area that I think is very important for me to speak about today uh, would be around fostering sustainability and managing your buyer and seller relationship. So the future is really about being more equitable, more innovative, and more inclusive. So social objectives of corporates have been really on a rise. So you see a lot of big shift of the corporates actually looking at their assets and actually wanting to incorporate ESG factors. So what are ESG is your environmental, your social, your governance factors. And, and really how the corporates actually respond to their employees, and to the community is also very, very heavily scrutinized nowadays. So I, I have a, my, my clear message is that I, I really see that an economic recovery as we are today is only resilient if we have an economy that is sustainable. So I guess, uh, let me just stop here by saying that um, let's, let's together build uh, towards an innovative and sustainable 
future together. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing. If you have any questions for Wendy, please use the Q&A function in Zoom or the command function in Facebook so Wendy could address them during the Q&A session later. Next up is Puan Sharimatun Matsale, Deputy CEO, Exporters Development of Martrade. She is responsible for leading, planning and coordinating various teams involved in implementing export assistance and facilitating programs in the Transformation and Digital Trade Division. Please join me to welcome Puan Sharimatun to talk about outlook and strategies to tap into new markets. Sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Very good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you to the STAR and Standard Chartered for this uh, lovely event where I'll be explaining about the outlook and strategies to tap into, into new markets and how Madrid can assist exporters into their export journey. So um, in terms of snapshots, I will look at, uh, I'll touch about the economic performance because to look at outlook, you have to know where we are today, where we are now, uh, and how to get there, where we want to go next. So I'll also be explaining about the assistance uh, programs that are available in Madrid on how to revive. We were in survival mode, but now we are in quarter three, so we are uh, going to be in revival mode. So how Madrid can assist companies, exporters in their revival. Then we'll look at the outlook and strategies and how to tap into uh, new markets and uh, looking at the strategic trust and how we promote uh, Malaysia. And I have a special um, segment just to talk about halal because that's an important uh, segment for Malaysia and for Madrid. Uh, next. Okay, um, don't worry too much about the graph, but if you just look at where the lines are going, uh, the blue lines actually indicate 2020. So you can see that uh, and um, the vertical lines uh, indicate the quarters. So first quarter, we were doing great. We were looking forward to 2020. Unfortunately, on March 18, the second quarter, uh, MCO happened. So on 18 March onwards in the second quarter, we can see a dip in the blue line. And the, the orange line was where we were in 2019. So you can see everything was almost at a standstill. Uh, goods could not move. Uh, companies uh, could hardly uh, do what they normally do on a day-to-day -day basis. So of course there was a decline, but quarter three, we can see uh, good uh, prospects as um, the export has shown increase yeah? and even in October, we have recorded 91.5 billion ringgit uh, of exports. And this is the third highest um, export ever for a month. So not bad. We do have um, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it's not all uh, doom and gloom. You, there is positive outlook. And uh, Malaysia's trade surplus in October also has widened to 22.12 billion ringgit. Uh, move on. To, yes. So, uh, so let's look at what are the sectors that recorded significant increases. Uh, it's no surprise that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, medical products such as rubber gloves recorded uh, an increase of like 82%. Electro diagnostic apparatus. Um, which includes temperature scanning device and all that, uh, recorded a significant increase of 94.5%. Disinfectants were previously, people in Malaysia were not really familiar with using disinfectants. And uh, then suddenly in Malaysia, we have recorded an export of an increase of 81.8% of disinfectants. Uh, and surgical masks, you see how much it has jumped 
465.5% uh, because previously uh, the base was rather low. So the increase in export of surgical masks really, really increased during the third quarter. Moving on. So in summary, what does the numbers tell you? It says that uh, quarter three, uh, the increase is driven by external demand. We are a very open uh, trading nation. So when we are an open economy, we are part of the global supply chain. Uh, the movement has started uh, to continue. Logistics could happen. So there is uh, exports uh, numbers improved. Not surprising that electrical and electronics continue to be our biggest export contributor. Uh, although these are multinationals, but uh, we know very well that many of the um, companies that supply to these multinationals are our locals. And some of the locals have also uh, ventured out and uh, built their own company. Those who does, for example, electronic uh, manufacturing services, they then become a supplier to the Intels the, uh, and, and so on, the multinationals. Yeah? And this is followed by petroleum products and palm oil, which we are also, again, a resource-based uh, economy. So uh, the significant increases were recorded, just now I mentioned rubber products, uh, other type of manufacturers, including like solid state drive, palm oil. And uh, what are the markets that showed increase? So we look at uh, the markets is China, Singapore, US, Hong Kong, and Japan. And coincidentally, or, you know, uh, these are also actually the economies who are part of RCEP, uh, which was mentioned by our uh, senior minister just now. So that's why uh, these markets are important for us. And uh, the world organizations such as IMF and WTO have upgraded its position, uh, projection of 2020, uh, that there is a recovery uh, compared to the quarter two, quarter three shows that there is a positive recovery and uh, 2021 will have better prospects for all of us. So uh, moving on, let's look at uh, what Madrid or how Madrid can assist in the revival. And um, just now Wendy also talked about digitalization. So uh, in terms of digitalization, uh, Matrix is aware of the pains or the, the challenges that are faced by our companies, our exporters, especially the SMEs. So we have added uh, new scopes in the market development grant, for example. If previously you can only uh, claim for expenses when you participate in international trade events where you actually fly to the market. Um, so. Now, even if you participate in uh, virtual trade events, and many of these, especially the established ones, they do charge uh, exhibitors uh, to participate because they, there's technology costs involved. So you can defray, you can reduce some of this cost by claiming a market development grant. And uh, a special provision just because of the pandemic, we were allowed um, uh, Actually, we, when I say we were allowed, because uh, Madrid cannot simply change the scope of the grants that we give. We have to actually request approval from the central agency. So logistic cost was allowed to be given um, um, uh, claim bags. Yeah? So companies who are exporting could claim for their logistic costs um, uh, for this period uh, until the end of the year. So this has helped uh, many, many companies in uh, reducing their cost of export. So uh, E-Trade is another uh, digital uh, intervention where e-commerce e has become extremely important, not just for domestic markets, but uh, also for cross-border e-commerce. That's why E-Trade continue to be an important um, assistance program for companies revival and of course uh, we besides looking at products we also have the services export export fund which are available for malaysian service providers the it companies the uh, professional services architects engineering construction uh, uh, islamic finance and things like that so uh, for uh, services sector they can also avail themselves to the grants that are available under the services export fund uh, moving on, we also have, um, we, next slide, um, next slide please, can we have the next slide? Can we have the next slide please?
Okay, there we go. Um, that's digitalization. Sometimes you have glitches, but you do need them uh, in order to be relevant uh, in the uh, current arena. And uh, we continue to engage with our uh, exporters, our um, in terms of providing training. So we have a lot of webinars going on. Uh, we have virtual exhibitions. Uh, I'm going to go specifically uh, about my effect later on. We also do online B2B business to business meetings, and we also provide market intelligence. And uh, by the way, this uh, market intelligence or my export portal, uh, we were given an award. Yeah, Matrix was given an award by ITC, International Trade. Uh, center in Geneva that recognize uh, matrix among all the matrix of the world uh, that uh, we have uh, effectively used uh, this digital platform, my export, to disseminate uh, trade and market intelligence to our exporters. Uh, next, please. So, uh, in order to be more holistic in our approach, we also have specific incentives for our. Uh, Boom Putra women and youth to ensure that uh, our the the communities are also engaged in export, and uh, we also work with uh, state uh, agencies and state governments uh, to ensure that our uh, companies, our entrepreneurs, become global entrepreneurs. And um, like I mentioned, uh, this journey we also work with many many uh, agencies and uh, bodies because. Uh, Export is normally at the end uh, of the uh, chain. You do need to have uh, your own uh, established domestic presence or domestic. You, you, as a company, you need to be resilient. So uh, then we need uh, these other agencies to work. And these are just a, a sample of the organizations that we work with. Next, please. Besides helping SMEs, which constitute 98.5% of the companies registered in Malaysia, we also help mid-tier companies. Uh, mid-tier companies, uh, although there are not many of them compared to the SMEs, which represent 98%, these 2% contribute almost 40% to the GDP. So they are an important segment uh, of the economy and they do export a lot. And uh, we work very closely with the alumni of this program, we, which we call MCMTC, Mid Tier Consortium, Nation Consortium of Mid Tier Companies. And uh, um, logos are just some of the companies that have uh, been participating in this, in this program where we do capacity building and as well as go to market activities. Next. Uh, just now, Esther also mentioned, uh, sorry, Wendy also mentioned about the importance of uh, ESG. Uh, sustainable is, sustainability is an important element. Now, our buyers out there in the world are not just looking at uh, your product, at the price of your product, but they also look at uh, how these products were manufactured. Uh, were you concerned about the environmental issues, the labor issues, uh, and so on. So. Uh, we do have programs, we do collaborate with partners to provide training to our exporters uh, on how to equip them better to meet the sustainable needs of the buyers and the uh, foreign uh, consumers out there. Next, please. So, uh, even um, within uh, when we were in this period of uh, MCO or CMCO, we have continued to assist Malaysian companies, even though like even right now where we can only have 30% of our employees coming to the office, but we continue to assist uh, exporters. Uh, for example, for the market development grant, we have disbursed uh, to 22 million uh, within the period, even though working from home, whilst only some can work in the office. We have assisted uh, 1,320 companies. This is just between January and November. And export sales of 3 uh, billion has been generated. E-commerce, in terms of e-trade, we have assisted uh, 774 companies. And just now I mentioned about the uh, my export, which uh, we received the award from the ITC, uh, 675 market alerts. These market alerts are important. Just now Wendy mentioned also about risk. How do you mitigate risk? So you have to know uh, what are the changes in regulations, what are the, uh, the alerts, what are the uh, 
uh, non-tariff barrier, any new tax imposed, and things like that. So all this information are provided uh, through my export. So all these market alerts, and we do uh, have uh, overseas office, the 46 overseas office. They provide product market study. Uh, in terms of how do you enter uh, a specific product. And um, so uh, we also receive trade inquiries from overseas buyers. So our overseas office also uh, generate these trade leads where companies can follow up on these trade leads and turn them into sales. Uh, we have been engaging in more than 145 webinars similar to this. Uh, these numbers are as at uh, November. And with more than uh, close to 8,000 viewers. Yeah. Next, um, let's look at the export promotion program. Um, we have this year in 2020, although this is uh, relatively a very bad year in uh, for mice industry because exhibitions are cancelled, many events, many global events are cancelled. In fact, but we managed to do 12. Some are conventional in the sense that they are actually, we managed to do them early part of the year or they do a hybrid event. Uh, for example, in China, ASEAN Expo, half of it is an actual event where there is still an, uh, a physical booth and there are still, uh, our trade commissioner is there and there are some companies, but many of uh, the participants are actually online and the exhibitors come online. So there are hybrid events we also did. Kuala Lumpur International Aerospace uh, Conference, KLI Business Conference, KLIABC, for example. So through all these events where we had 525 companies uh, participate, we have already generated uh, 1.54 billion ringgit of export sales. We look at e -Bismatch. This is a new, um, this is what I mentioned just now as a B2B meeting. We call this uh, e -Bismatch. This all happens digitally. And um, you can look at uh, the photograph, uh, the, the, the photos that shows a daily event. Um, probably two, three can happen uh, in Madrid daily. Uh, we have our trade overseas office uh, uh, matching our Malaysian exporters with prospective buyers. So we arrange uh, meetings online since we cannot uh, be doing our typical trade promotion events like the trade fair or the uh, export acceleration mission where we bring companies. So they meet online, a lot of the introduction is done. So the risk is uh, slight, uh, slightly mitigated in the sense that the buyers uh, that were introduced by our trade commissioners, uh, they know who they are. All right, next. This is... Uh, the my impact exhibition so as we know uh, the country has successfully uh, finished the my impact um, it's actually a whole year event uh, where the 21 economies uh, have met uh, digitally the first ever in the world uh, malaysia is the first ever first country in the world that have managed to uh, conduct this event virtually and alongside the impact um, event is an exhibition organized by Madrid called My Epic 2020 Exhibition. So although earlier this was planned to be a physical event, uh, we have turned everything to virtual. So we had uh, 274 exhibitors with their uh, virtual booths with 221 Malaysian companies. Uh, we had 8,000, more than 8,000 viewers from 89 economies. So it wasn't just the 21 um, Apex economies that viewed this, uh, also other economies also uh, visited the booth. We had uh, 513 buyers, and uh, the sales have actually reached 573 million ringgit, uh, with uh, so many business meetings uh, among exhibitors as well as non-exhibitors. Because earlier it was meant for exhibitors, but then some buyers requested for products that the exhibitors didn't produce. So we, we also uh, worked with non-exhibitors and had the business meeting online. So there were business uh, pitching, there were webinars that uh, went on. Um, moving on to the next slide. Okay, um, this looks like a busy slide, uh, but what I wanted to share is just that uh, when we look at uh, markets to go into and what products to promote, we don't just you know, uh, simply choose uh, uh, without any data. We actually looked at 
uh, data in terms of growth, uh, export growth, uh, um, CAGR, the average export growth, and map that against the FTA partner countries. Uh, so then we identify potential markets. Then we match that with potential products. We looked at products that had high demand. So looked at the data again, uh, which uh, numbers had positive growth, and then looked at where potential uh, demand was. Um, then uh, look at the capacity, uh, where what products can Malaysia produce. Uh, and similar process goes for services. So then uh, in the next page, you can see uh, all this data we run through in the next slide. In, in the next slide, yeah, you can see this map. So this map just shows uh, from all the data that we have run through, we have identified uh, this 33 countries and of course uh, all the RCEP countries are also highlighted the the blue uh, marks uh, uh, the different um, the markets that uh, have potential formulation products so next I'm almost finishing um, in terms of uh, market expansion uh, we do know that there are some gaps but we look at uh, the issues uh, we look at the challenges and uh, we recognize the importance of strengthening the export ecosystem. Uh, and so how do we uplift export capacity uh, and then look at elevating Malaysia's strength in export, uh, harness the growth of uh, Malaysian uh, e-commerce players and facilitate them uh, to widen market access, uh, promote Malaysia's brand and products, uh, as well as uh, look at um, investment as also a, a means for export diversific diversification and of course sustainability just now which is an important agenda so uh, uh, so after applying all this uh, we look at all the different sectors and one of the sectors that we also i'm just giving an example is also halal uh, because if you look at the next slide uh, this shows the importance of uh, the the prospect of the halal uh, market for Malaysia. Malaysia is well known as a halal player. Is a uh, in terms of uh, we have eight. Uh, you know we lead the uh, Malaysia leads in the uh, global Islamic economy indicator. We are the eighth. Uh, we have the the market potential is more than USD 2.4 trillion and so on. Uh, so the segments it's not just food there's also islamic finance muslim friendly travel pharma and cosmetics media and modest fashion uh, next the next slide we have mihas um, i just wanted to show uh, that among the different sectors Mihas is uh, one program that we have yearly, but this year we were not able to undertake Mihas because of the uh, COVID. So uh, 2021, so look forward to Mihas. It will be happening on the 9th to the 12th of September, 2021. And uh, for the other sectors, uh, you can look out uh, to our portal and all the social media that Madrid has. Uh, in the thank you slide, you have the different uh, social media um, platforms that Madrid has. So you can, uh, by next week, all the 2021 uh, work program will be displayed and you can actually participate and register yourself, uh, plan yourself on what are the events uh, that you can participate in with us in 2021. So thank you so much for your attention. We look forward to engaging more with you and um, I give Esther back the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Puan Sharimatun, for the insightful take. Once again, if you have questions for Puan Sharimatun, please use the Q&A function in Zoom or the comment box in Facebook. We will address questions from the audience in a few minutes.
Hi, Wendy and Puan Shari. I have questions for both of you. I have the first two for Wendy. How has digitalization progressed in Asia? Yes, um, thanks Esther. I think that's a very interesting question. So I think you, you, everyone will have noticed that in, in Asia, right, the digitalization agenda has been very diverse. Um, there has been, the reason for this is because different countries have different levels of maturity on how they take upon uh, digitalization, right? So um, I guess it's, it's a very, it's challenging, but it's different uh, with opposed to say uh, the European region where a lot of things are very standardized. Um, in the last one, two years, you will see a lot of ASEAN, Asia markets, countries actually getting together and it's like a race towards a, a checklist or cashless sort of society. And you see a lot of them actually opening up to digital payments, digital collection capabilities. So a lot of us would have, uh, on our own personal basis, also would have experienced instant payments. Uh, in Malaysia, it's called Do It Now. In different, in various other countries, they just have a different name, but it's all towards uh, doing um, uh, payments digitally and instantly. Um, so we also see a lot of collaboration now going into cross-border digital as well. And, and I guess um, we go into things like QR cross-border, we go into instant payment cross-border, and, and the R step for some in some ways will also assist to to further broaden the digitalization agenda in, in Asia. So I think the I mean to me the, the future is really bright. Uh, uh, the pandemic has also helped to accelerate this as well. So, um, I mean, watch watch this space and see uh, what happens next for Asia. Thank you very much, Esther. Okay. Second, Second question, question, also for Wendy. Wendy. How, How does, does letter of credit, credit help exporters? Okay. Um, I think first let me explain what is a letter of credit. Letter of credit uh, is an old name. It's actually called Documentary Credit uh, DC now. So what, what really is an LC, right? It's a it's an undertaking, it's an agreement from a bank to actually pay the exporter, the seller, in as long as the doc, the agreement, the agreement's terms and conditions are actually met. So by me saying that actually, it really um, goes back, circles back to what I mentioned much earlier about the risk element. So when I say that it's an undertaking from a bank, you will then realize that um, the, the risk has shifted from the bank, um, from, from the earlier to get money from your buyer towards the bank now. So I mean, this, this, is, this is what an LC is, and this is how it actually helps, um, helps exporters. And, and further to that, I guess you also realize that with an LC, you can also finance it. So you can also do trade financing. Uh, we would call it a trade as trade discounting in order to get your funds upfront as well. And also to some extent, if, even if the banks are the banks that, that the, the LC is issued from are from banks that you don't even know as well, you can also come to the bank for advice and the bank can also give you some confirmation around it. So that's that's typically what an LC would be to help exporters. Thanks, Esther. I have two questions for Kwan Matun. The first question, Malaysia is one of the biggest trading nations in the world. Why is it important that we continue to refresh our trade partnerships, especially in the increasingly digitized world? Okay, uh, thank you, Esther, for that question, or whoever who posted that. Um, yes, uh, we need to continue to engage with the other partner countries. For example, uh, the RCEP, it took eight years, imagine, eight years of negotiation uh, between these 21 economies. And in uh wasn't easy to conclude by METI, uh, led by METI. So uh, basically, um, when when an agreement is uh, is reached, uh, each country will be uh, trying to get better deals because uh, not only when when you export, you have to deal with tax, import tax. Uh, the tariff barrier is there. There's also non-tariff barrier, which can even be more complicated because there's a lot of regulations, requirements, uh, things that makes. Uh, um, the export process even more difficult or it increases the cost of doing business so uh, through negotiations or through agreements such as those uh, uh, the economies actually manage to agree on certain uh, 
things. So there are like 20 chapters in the RCEP document, for example. And uh, it helps uh, to prioritize. Uh, so we will be given special preference. Think of it like uh, if you go, um, to make it simple, uh, if you shop in Sogo, you have a Sogo uh, card, for example. So when you have this loyalty card, you are given special preference, right? So think of it as that. Like we have this special membership where we uh, are given special preference rate, especially in terms of import duties. And in terms of the non-tariff barriers, there's also efforts to continue between all the governments to look at how to simplify things. So uh, that means as a member, we get to be recognized that you should recognize our uh, standards uh, and so there's this mutual recognition going on. So that makes the export process easier so that Malaysian exporters have a competitive advantage among the other uh, 14 uh, countries in, in the case of RCEP and so on. The second question also for Puan Sharimatun. The fight for foreign investments is heating up. What must we do to stay ahead and not get left behind by countries that are now catching catching up and are seen as having more potential. Okay, um, I think uh, that's heavy questions in the sense a lot of things have to be done. Uh, I think the government have started uh, in the right direction because there's a lot of emphasis on, for example, skilling, upskilling, looking at uh, talent needs, looking at industries, uh, digitalization, so the industry forward, looking at uh, how do you facilitate uh, exports, so how do we make our companies understand the different aspects of, uh, for example, uh, doing export online through e-commerce, the importance of digital marketing. So Malaysians were not familiar with digital marketing before. Although Malaysians are quite famous as to be very socially connected, I think, uh, I can't remember the, the rank, but probably number two, number four in the world uh, to use uh, social media as a social media uh, platform to connect and to to reconnect with old friends and all that. But with digitalization, with digital marketing, we are assisting companies to understand how do you push your product so that when people search a certain product, uh, you know, your company, your brand uh, is visible to many more uh, buyers. And how do you push content? Uh, how do you have, uh, you know, good uh, photography, how do you do copywriting well so that people are attracted to your uh, website or your um, platform. So uh, it's, it's really important. Uh, I think the government has provide, uh, provided so many assistance programs, facilitation and incentives, but it's also important for the companies out there. Uh, yes, agreements were signed, it has yet to be ratified, but uh, you cannot just sit at your desk and expect things to, you know, inquiries to tap at your door or at your laptop. You actually have to do things. You actually have to engage, for example, with METI to understand um, how does this work? How do I get my special preference, this membership uh, preference? How do I get it? It's not automatic. There are certain processes that you need to apply, uh, forms that needs to be filled, although, you know, it's... Uh, uh, the government is trying to uh, reduce more and more the bureaucracy and make it seamless for everyone, there is still effort to be taken by the exporters. And I mentioned so many programs that uh, we have in Madrid, yet I do still meet some people who don't know that we have all these facilities available for them. So do grab the opportunities, the opportunities is there, leverage on us in Madrid. We have 46 overseas office and we collaborate with many, many partners. We can't do this alone. We have to collaborate with financial institution, with government agencies, state agencies, um, you know, NGOs, when you talk about sustainable and all that. So many, many uh, part of the communities has to be engaged. So that's my take on that. Thank you. I have the next two for Wendy. The first one, can you explain how banks handle digital disruption? Hmm. Okay. So I guess digital disruption is everywhere today, right? It's not just in banking. So 
technology changes are like happening everywhere and bringing in new players bringing in new ways of doing things and really changing the whole landscape of of the way all of us do do our our normal things as before I, and i guess in banking you would have seen a lot of news to to hear about fintechs how they are moving faster they are innovating very fast and the truth is that this is probably uh good because it has actually helped to accelerate the landscape of banking itself right so but but what's really happening is that um we are actually uh living in a in an ecosystem where we work better together and it actually makes sense so we actually partnering and we actually doing a lot of co-creation with this uh other uh, organizations and fintechs to actually ensure that at the end of the day um i i guess the bank can do everything the fintech can do everything as well and that's about the collaboration and how we can uh work together in order to provide the complete um, service delivery to our clients so that's that's my answer to this the next, next question also for wendy small, small traders, traders who are newly set up are, are facing difficulties to get facility line and lc how can the banks help get lc from banks yeah so an lc or any facility for that matter whether it's a trade finance or what it, it requires actually a um, someone to look into it from the bank uh, a relationship manager to actually evaluate the credit and actually provide the facilities so i guess um i mean there are a lot of programs for various segments i mentioned small medium enterprises i mentioned middle market there are a lot of programs that are available today um that can help um to provide this kind of facilities to them including in during this covid-19 right there are a lot of relief measures as well and 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 we are actually we actually stand guided by bank negara with their guidelines on how to then finance this eligible corporates who are impacted as well um as we we know it's also a very challenging time right and and we also want to do our part as a bank to actually ease clients challenges around this so um yeah i think i think that the the question the person asking the question should actually come over to the bank uh try to reach out to one of our client service uh, managers or the or the relationship manager to get more information on what kind of programs they can come into to to obtain such facilities the next one is for panchari does the export of services include training and educational services can training companies have access to mdg grants to undertake the promotion of their services overseas through participation in trade fairs and missions you need to unmute panchari yes the answer is yes uh, yes uh, educational uh, companies uh, training providers they are considered uh, an export of service and they can claim uh, under market development grant if it is about participation in uh, trade fairs and so on there's also the services export fund that uh can be accessible to service providers for example they want to set up uh, um um and uh, uh, service companies overseas there is also feasibility studies that they have to do so some of this cost they can claim under the services export fund so definitely yes services is important to malaysia and we do assist service providers not just uh, products The next question is for Wendy, but I believe both of you may answer. How do you foresee the acceptance of blockchain with all parties supporting the supply chain to support trade financing? Yeah, maybe maybe I can start. Um I guess it, it really comes back a little bit to my 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 um discussion point earlier. I mean the way forward is really on the digitalization agenda and blockchain is one of them. because um using blockchain everyone is actually on a common platform and when you do that it means that the trade documents that used to be very uh paper based and needed to be transported from one place to another place would actually be able to be seen digitally so with that you can then cut down the timing in terms of speed right we're talking about within um from from say a weeks or, or a week to say uh very fast right in, in within a day or, or within hours you can actually uh, complete a transaction so that's the power of it um, and this is something that's very 
um, very interesting, uh, which will be coming up in the future where everyone can actually come on board. And I, and I see this, I mean, this is one of the very key uh, digitalization solutions coming up, especially in trade. Okay, okay. Um, I, right. Uh, I also see uh, economies are moving so fast in terms of blockchain. For example, uh, in China, uh, it's it's amazing to me. I mean, uh, how fast they have grown in terms of digitalization and blockchain being one of it. Um, you talk about e-wallet, the the Alipay, the uh, what have you. There's just so many. Even beggars use. Uh, uh, they do, they don't put a, a hat for you or bowl for you to throw your coins. But yeah, you have QR codes. You have um, uh, you know you can just WeChat it or you can just Alipay it to, to uh, provide uh, you know money not just when you pay but even to those uh, street performers and things like that so to me it's really uh, amazing uh, how fast other countries have grown and in Malaysia we cannot be left behind and for our exporters to be relevant these are things that uh, we have to understand so for many of us uh, baby boomers this is definitely a new challenge It's a new chapter for us to understand it's not so uh, straightforward uh, for us baby boomers but I, I believe many of the youngsters out there they understand this very well and and they have to be uh, continuously engaged uh, when they do export and trading overseas I have another one for Wendy how has the pandemic affected the transactional business side of banks, especially when it comes to the export and import? Yeah, I guess the pandemic has really been very challenging for everyone, right? Not just banks, but all, all, all industries. And um, I mean, Standard Chartered has really come up very strong um, by providing first globally a $1 billion COVID fund to help any corporates that are actually um, fighting against the, the, the pandemic. Right, so that, that's one thing, and and I, and I take the pandemic as an opportunity where um people have actually, I mean, as it, it really accelerated the the people towards using more digital tools, and and this then um creates more efficiency, more automation, reduces um fraud. I mean, all these things are actually very good, uh, and and the bank actually looks forward um towards moving into this so-called, I mean, the country as well, moving out of being a cashless and checkless society, right? And moving into going digital. So it's a it, it's, it's a positive uh, future for us. And um, I, I really look forward to it. I mean, in, in, in and hopefully when when the vaccine comes in and all people will be more um, more ready and, and the growth momentum will come back again, right? Okay, I have the, the last, last question, question for both of you. How will e-wallets and digital transactions disrupt the use of cash in society? And will physical cash will remain king? I okay, I, I can start. <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, I I I seldom hold cash anymore. I would always uh, prefer to use my mobile phone to actually purchase or, or, or you know do anything so uh i mean it also comes back to panchari Maton earlier mentioning about uh, future demographics of people right the the younger generation today i think they're moving towards not even going out of their house anymore they don't want to go to a physical store to buy things they want to do everything basically from their home so i think this is a this is this is a new norm this is a new way of doing things that i mentioned right and, and if we don't keep up to this uh, we will be left behind. As you have seen, a lot of a lot of uh, companies. I think if you all read in the press and all, a lot of companies have actually gone down because they just continue a way of working. So, and and, uh, and a lot of very innovative new platform companies and all. You notice that they have also changed, metamorphosis their whole business from being something to another something else to actually go in line with this technology change. So. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's how I see the, the, the future going forward. Yes, uh, for exporters, definitely it's very relevant. Uh, you talk about e-wallet. Uh, you're surprised that many of our Malaysian companies don't even have a website. 
So how how can uh, buyers look at you if you're not present in the digital world? You're not present in the buyer's mind because uh, before they do any business with you, they will check you, uh, you out, look for you in, uh, in the website, if not in the website, in social media, what people say about you, what is the feedback. This uh, this is very typical, right? When you shop online, you, you need to see the feedback, uh, how other buyers uh, commented about the seller, uh, whether they uh, received it in time, whether, whether the product is what it seems. Uh, and and the response if there's some issues so the same goes for e-wallet e-payment if if you don't have all these facilities and you, you're not even present uh, in your website you don't have a story to tell out there people will not uh, know who you are so you're not uh, it's no longer when uh, uh, e-commerce is there it's not just business to business it's also business to consumer so now it's not just Malaysia trading with China, for example. It's uh, Seremban doing business to Chengdu, for example. It, it's it's a whole new realm. And, and if we are not adapting to all these changes, uh, yes, we might be left behind. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies. Really, really appreciate. appreciate. Thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. Before we end tonight's session, please help us to complete the evaluation poll, which will appear on your, your Zoom screen right now. If you would like to find out more about Export Excellence Awards, do head over to exportawards.com.my or click on the link in the chat or comment section below. Once again, our deepest gratitude to YB Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali for taking time off to deliver the keynote address. Also, a big thank you to Wendy and Puan Sharimatun for joining us tonight. And thanks everyone for tuning in as well. We hope you have gained some valuable takeaways from this. That's all the time we have. Thank you for having me as your host tonight. Good night and stay safe.